Last week at RailsConf, the first release candidate of Rails 4 was announced, so it's a great time to try upgrading to Rails 4 in your own projects, that way you can see if it works and report any bugs that you may come across. Now I've already covered many of the new features of Rails 4 in episode 400, so in this episode we'll be focusing on the process of upgrading a Rails 3.2 app to Rails 4. This way you can follow along in your own applications. So the first step is to make sure you're on the latest version of Rails 3.2, and that all of your gems are up to date as well. Also, you need to be on Ruby 193 or greater. Next, make sure that your test suite is fully passing. Uh, if you don't have any automated tests, then it's going to make the upgrade process a lot more difficult and require a lot of manual testing. So it's a good idea to maybe add some integration tests at this point if you don't have them. Looks like we're all passing in this application, so let's upgrade to Rails 4. I recommend doing this in a separate Git branch, so let's make a Rails 4 branch here. And next, going to the gem file, we can upgrade the version of Rails 4 from 3.2 to 4.0.0 RC1, or whatever the latest version of Rails 4 is for you. Now we'll need to change the versions of these other gems as well. Uh, SAS Rails is 4.0.0 RC1, Coffee Rails is just 4.0.0, and Uglifier gem I think is uh, 1.3.0. Also, Rails 4 is doing away with the assets group, so you can remove uh, this group block here. And I believe that the uh, production environment will not try to dynamically generate any assets by default in Rails now, that it will just uh, use the static pre-compiled assets. To go along with this change, the assets are now intended to be pre-compiled in the production environment, so if you are running this rake task to pre-compile the assets, make sure to set the Rails environment to production when doing so. A nice side effect of this change is that it simplifies the application config file. Before we had to load the gems matching the assets group, but only in development and test environments. So now we can just replace this code with a simple bundle require and loading the Rails environment group. Now, if you do miss the assets group in your production setup, you can certainly add something like that on your own and just customize that group loading behavior here. Now let's give this a try and run bundle update to install the new version. So this appeared to work successfully, but the bundle update command can sometimes have some unexpected behavior. Uh, to see this behavior, let's try running bundle outdated, which is a little known command, but it's pretty useful to find the gems which are out of date. So this only found two gems, builder, and that's pretty close, but paper trail, that version is way off, and that's because it tried to find a version compatible with Rails 4, which happened to be 164, and 271 relies on Rails 3. So we have some issues with the recent version of Paper Trail. This is one reason it's important to be more strict on which version you want to accept. So our Paper Trail gem here doesn't have any version specified, so let's make sure it's uh, close to 271. And this time, when I run bundle update, I get this error message saying that there's a version uh, conflict because Paper Trail expects Active Record around version 3. So we're going to have to find a different version of Paper Trail that's compatible with Rails 4. In this case, Paper Trail has a Git branch for Rails 4 support, but this is going to change depending on the gem, and there likely will be other gems that you find are incompatible with Rails 4. So check out the issue tracker for each specific project to see what the status is. So let's change this version number to use the GitHub project and to use the uh, Rails 4 branch. Now I'll try running bundle update again, and this time it'll fetch paper trail through the GitHub project. And it looks like that worked. So now that we've got our gems up to date, let's try running our specs. And that fails miserably. So uh, let's look at the error message here. And it looks like it's complaining about cache's page being undefined. So I am doing page caching in this app, which has actually been removed in Rails 4, along with many other things such as observers and protected model attributes and uh, active resource. So if you need any of these features though, the good news is that you can easily add them back through gems. So going to the gem file, I'm just going to paste in a list of gems here, which I recommend adding during the upgrade process. And there are a couple of others you might want to add, such as active resource. But in this app, let's add these so that we don't get any errors that are related to these extractions. By the way, when you're doing a major version upgrade like this, I think it's important to get in a working state as quickly as possible. So try to avoid any large refactorings or big changes to the app. And these gems will help with that. And then when you get your test passing, you can uh, clean up the code and maybe transition into other solutions which don't rely on these gems. So I'll run the bundle command to get those gems installed. And now let's try running our specs again to see if we can actually get them to run. And uh, this time, uh, nope, we get this exception. Now we are going to see a lot of deprecation warnings at the top, but let's focus on whatever the stack trace 
is reporting, and that looks like it's complaining about the router because the match method is no longer accepted. So here's the router with the match method, and normally you'll just want to convert this to a git request, but if you want to support other types, you could add them here, or if you want to support multiple types, you can add a via and then either an array of options or a via all to support any a type of request. But here, let's just do a git request. So let's try running our specs again. And uh, they actually run this time, but there are a lot of failures. And this is complaining about mass assigning attributes for version, which is a model supplied by Paper Trail. So this is uh, now a gem that's expected to run in Rails 4 with strong parameters, but we're still using protected attributes. We can get around this issue by going to our application config file and adjusting this option that sets whitelist attributes to true, because that is going to expect adder accessible to be defined in every model, which probably isn't going to be the case while you're transitioning to strong parameters. So let's just set this to false for now. Now let me try running the specs again, and they run and looks like they all pass, yay. So this uh, has a ton of deprecation warnings though, so let's kind of walk through these and try to debug them. Many of them have to do with configuration options such as whiny nils. This is no longer necessary. So I'm going to do this kind of quickly and walk you through the different configuration changes to get up to speed with Rails 4. So going under the development config file, uh, we want to remove whiny nils, and instead we need to set eager loading in each of these environments. So eager loading set to false in development, and then uh, we also need to just remove a few of these options that are no longer necessary for us to specify here. And then next we can configure production, and here we need to specify eager loading and set that to true. And the compress line changes to JS compressor, setting it to uglifier. And then under test, we remove uh, whiny nails here and set eager loading to false. And I'll also remove the mass assignment sanitizer because we'll be transitioning to strong parameters. Now a quick note about the asset pipeline. If we look in our application config file, we have this leftover option uh, setting it to enabled. However, this is no longer necessary because in Rails 4, the asset pipeline is enabled by default. So you'll want to set it to false if you don't use the asset pipeline. If you do, you can just remove that config option. Now there's one more configuration change I want to make and that is under the secret token initializer. In Rails 4, this configuration option has been renamed to uh, secret key base and you'll want to specify both a secret token and secret key base while you're transitioning from Rails 3 to Rails 4. Once you've made that transition successfully, you can remove the secret token. Oh, and you'll probably want to use a different secret for the key base. So this uh, transition is necessary because we're going from uh, just a serialized cookie stored on the client side to an encrypted cookie. This prevents the user from easily being able to see the contents of the uh, session cookie. Wow, so I made a lot of configuration changes here, but I didn't cover everything. So what I recommend doing is creating a new Rails 4 app, and then you can take a look at the generated config files and compare them with your own to see what else you might want to pull over. So with those changes, let's try running our specs again to make sure we didn't break anything and to see if we've dwindled down those deprecation notices. And we're still getting a lot of deprecations, but thankfully, they're mostly duplicates. One of the deprecation warnings is inside this episode model. And that is whenever you're defining a named scope like we are here, you'll need to pass in a callable object as a second argument, like a lambda, for example. So we could do this instead. And that's necessary because it's very often to accidentally uh, set something dynamic in here, such as the time, which we were doing before. And that was actually a bug because uh, we don't want to set this to a time when the class is loaded. We want it to actually change every time this scope is called. Now the other deprecation is inside of this episodes controller. Uh, here I'm calling episode find all by pro and setting that to false. So uh, dynamic finder methods like this are no longer supported. So instead we can just change this to where the pro attribute is false, even more concise. And now when we run our specs again, it looks like they all pass with no deprecation warnings. Yay. Now that we've cleaned up the deprecations, we can focus on other transitions such as two strong parameters. So I covered strong parameters in episode 371, but we can do the transition quickly here. It's basically a way to move the mass assignment restrictions out of the model. So instead of adder accessible, we put them in the controller. So let's take these attributes here. 
And then going into the controller, let's define a private method down here at the bottom called uh, episode params. And this is just a conventional way to do it, but there are a variety of ways we could do it. Uh, let's extract the episode parameters that are submitted through the form and then call permit on this and then pass in those same attributes into here that we had in our model. Now it's also a good idea to change these square brackets to a call to require. That way it ensures that that episode uh, parameters hash is available and it doesn't report a nil exception if it's not. Now we just need to use the episode params whenever we access the parameters that are submitted through the form. So whenever we're updating that episode or creating a new episode. There we go. So once we've done this everywhere in the app, we can go into the gem file and remove our protected attributes gem because it's no longer necessary. Oh, and you'll also want to remove any configuration options relating to that, such as in your application config file, we can clear out this whitelisted attributes uh, config option. And running our specs, and they still pass. So we've got one of these gems down, and it might be a little bit tricky to transition away from these others. Uh, Rails observers, we could use uh, callbacks instead. And page caching, I think, still has some really good use cases, so you might want to keep using that. Uh, action caching, HTTP caching, I think is a better alternative. Check out episode 321 for that. And I just found out that deprecated finders isn't necessary to mention here because it's already a dependency on Rails 4.0, and uh, once 4.1 is released, then it will uh, be removed. Now before I go, I want to mention a few other minor changes that you might want to make, and one is in the controllers. Uh, the before filters, you can now call them before action. Uh, there isn't a deprecation notice for before filter, but this is a little clearer, I think. And in the uh, routes file, if you have any uh, put specific verbs, you can uh, rename them to the patch verb because that seems to better fit uh, the updating of a record. A couple other things, if you do have a test directory in your app, uh, the structure has changed a little bit for that. Try creating a new Rails app to see the new structure. And also the uh, vendor plugins directory is no longer used or accepted, so you can uh, move plugins out either into a gem or into the, the lib directory. And that's about it. We've now successfully upgraded this application to Rails 4. Now there are many other Rails 4 features that I haven't covered here, but I have in past episodes, so be sure to check out the Rails 4 category to see those. And there are many other great resources mentioned in the blog post announcing the release candidate. Be sure to check those out. And that's all I have for this episode on upgrading to Rails 4. Thanks for watching.